Good morning and welcome to another of the Talk Wildlife specials on safaris and in particular Kruger Park. Once again I've got Robert with me from Outlook Safaris. Hi Robert. Hi Alan, thanks for having me back. No problem at all, just be careful of the elephants in the background there and you'll be all right. <laughs> I'm I'm with Skakuza today, we'll talk Skakuza later on. Um, so today is going to be about camps and it's basically just a very slight introduction to the camps across Kruger and we're talking about some of the main camps um, but it's to put it into context of sort of the habitat and the areas that you'll be in and some of the sort of types of species you might see around that area um, and if there's any special uh, animals in the area then I'm sure Robert will mention them and we'll certainly sort of pay homage to the honey badger which eludes me um, but won't because one day I will see them. Right, so what I'm going to do, I'll share screen because we've got a few pictures. So I'll share screen and then we'll walk through. And we're going to walk through from the top of Kruger at the north down to the south. I suggest you don't walk through, I suggest you drive. Um, but we're about to do that and we'll start off with the camps in the north. So I'll just share screen. Robert, I want your second. Right, hopefully, Robert, you can see my screen now. Yep. And you're still there and I can hear you loud and clear. Was the silence just to test me? No. Are you, <laughs> are you ready for me to go ahead? I'm ready. Right, so we'll start off. So this is um, right up sort of, well, especially sort of Punda Maria. Punda Maria uh, looks to be, if I'm right, probably the most northern of the larger camps. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. That's the, the most northerly camp that you would find in the Kruger Park. There is alternative accommodation, but these are, we're covering them, the main camps of the park. So yes, that would be the most northerly main camp that you could stay at. So, yeah, so you... Punda Maria, sorry. No, no, carry on. So Punda Maria, if you have a look at the photos on the right of the screen there, that's that's Punda Maria. Uh, those are the typical rooms that would be available for the public to stay in. Uh, still part of the old buildings that they erected and um, they've just had some refurbishing done over the years. And then just below that you'll see a small picture of a safari tent. Uh, those are very popular and uh, part of the newer sort of style of accommodation. There's several of those tents that have been um, put up in Punda Maria and they actually have their own ensuite toilet and shower facilities as well and have this uh, wonderful views over the bush. So a lot of people prefer the tented accommodation as opposed to staying in those rooms. The only difference would be the, the tented accommodation doesn't have any air conditioning, so it would be something a person needs to think about in the, the hot summer months. But Punda Maria, very good area. It's one of the quieter areas of the park, generally where people that would visit the park on a regular basis would like to, and, and like to get away from the crowds would like to, would typically go up to the northern parts of the of the park and then also it's a good place for for bird lovers several species that you'd find in the area that you typically wouldn't find further south in the park so that's Punda Maria and then just to the left there on the screen is Shingwedzi camp uh, you can see the top image there is just the entrance to the camp itself quite a big camp um, uh, at the bottom photo is taken from the restaurant area overlooking the Shingwedzi River which is pretty dry there. It's actually quite dry for most of the, the year with just some pools of water left. Um, that attracts a lot of wildlife so with the camp being based at the, at the river's edge like that it attracts a lot of animals, elephants, buffalo especially and then they have a lot of nice big sycamore fig trees, uh, jackalberry trees along the river. Uh, so also very good for things like leopards, 
lions venture into the area. So just the, the wildlife around directly around Chingwedzi area can be very productive. Uh, quite a popular camp, but because of its locality, uh, it is also typically a camp that is fairly quiet. Uh, not too many tourists going through there. If if you avoid the, the obvious school holiday period, which can be very busy. Right, and just to get back to uh, Punda Maria, uh, you you mentioned that it was good for birds. Can you give us an idea of some of the species that might be seen around there? Yeah, sure. So a lot of the the, the typical species that you could find further south in the park as well. But if you're thinking of species. Um, for the Punda Maria area in particular, then you'd be looking at things like white-breasted cuckoo shrike. Um, you'd be looking for Arnott's chat in the woodland surrounding it. A lot of people go to Punda Maria for the sunset drives where you can see things like pennant wing night jars. Um, what else? Uh, Three-banded corsa. Uh, which you can find a little further south towards Shingwedzi as well in the Mopani felt. These are typical species that you'd find up there. Puna Maria actually um, was very popular a couple of years back, I think it is now, with orange wing pytilias that were seen at the little water holes in the camp. Uh, th this is a species which you would typically only find further north in Zimbabwe and in broadleafed woodland. So it that was quite a big attraction. So I'm sure they're still in the area, um, but these are of the species you could expect to find around Puna Maria. Right, brilliant. Okay, and then we move a little bit further south and we come to Mapani. Um, again, that view looks absolutely staggering. What is is that? What river is that? Is it a river? No, that's actually a dam. Oh, right. um, that the camp sort of overlooks. So you've got these viewpoints where you can sit and, and look at the dam as one would expect. Hippos, crocodiles in there, attracts a lot of bird life as well, storks, herons, um, various other species. So that left hand image is a public viewpoint where people can go and sit and just have, enjoy the view. But there is also views from the actual restaurant and a bar area overlooking the dam. And then there's a walk that you can do within the camp um, that'll take you closer to the edge of the dam. And then on the right side is the typical accommodation that one would expect in Mopani, uh, more sort of a rock structure. And one of the appeals to Mopani camp is that the bush, which isn't that evident in these pictures, but the, the, the bush between the bungalows uh, is a lot of natural vegetation, whereas some of the camps have manicured lawns. This has the more typical uh, bush that you'd expect once you left the camp. Um, so they have had various species come into the camp before. And of course, having it natural like that attracts a lot of good bird life to the camp itself too. Sure, sure. And then a bit further south again, we've got uh, Lataba and uh, Olifants and Palabora. So we'll talk about them three. So this is Lataba. Yes, so Lataba again, uh, adjacent to the Lataba River, which you'll see in the big image there, just to the right. You've got the Lataba River, which is one of the larger rivers flowing through the park. Um, these camps that are or next to or adjacent to rivers are usually the popular ones because of the the wildlife or the game viewing opportunities that they offer. So that big image is from the restaurant area overlooking the Lataba River. Then you've got just to the left the tented accommodation. Lataba is, is a fairly big camp. They've got a variety of accommodation types that is just of the, the safari tents that you could book if you were looking for to go something more budget style. Um, Lataba is quite well known for the bushbuck that they have, bushbuck and nyala antelope that roam through the camp and they've become quite habituated to people. Um, and lovely big 
riverine vegetation trees as one could expect and then the bottom image there shows a big statue of an elephant and that building just behind the elephant is the, the elephant museum so this mu museum is um, also quite a big attraction for people visiting that area of the park they showcase what was known as the magnificent seven and these were seven of the biggest tuskers that ever roamed the kruger park and they've still got the skulls and the tusks on display and then just interesting facts about elephants as well so very popular camp for people to stop at it's kind of a, a midway between the north and then venturing to the southern part um, so a popular camp yeah and i'm glad you explained yeah. that was a statue <laughs> Right, so the next one we've got is uh, Olifants. Uh, Olifants Afrikaans for elephants, is it? Yes, correct. So Olifants is, or Olifant is the Afrikaans word for an elephant. And they, uh, this particular camp is set up on the hillside and you've got that beautiful view of the Olifants River down below. Um, as you can imagine, you could just spend all day watching elephants crossing hippos are very vocal and active down there and having that height advantage um, i've been there before when you have vultures and various raptors soaring close by so a brilliant camp to be staying at most of the, well not most of a lot of the accommodation actually gives you that view of the river some of it is set further back and as that smaller image to the left shows, is that sort of the typical accommodation one would expect. These rondavals or circular bungalows that the person would be staying in. And um, they recently just got swimming pools. Swimming pools, just as a matter of interest, was something that not all the camps had in the park at one stage. But as they have upgraded camps and accommodation, all your main camps in the park now have a swimming pool for people to cool down in in the summer months. Yeah, and I think um, what that picture on the right shows is just the vastness. You know, it, when you look out like that, it, it's just incredible. You know, when you're in the park itself, you know, landscapes just go on forever. It's just amazing. Yes, agreed. And I think a lot of people, it's something that you kind of have to wrap your head around and you only get a true appreciation for the vastness when you've spent a few days in the park and you've been able to travel between camps and to see the distances between camps and between roads. Uh, in fact, the, the, the road network um, in the park, they estimate the roads that public can travel on only takes up around seven to eight percent of the entire park so most of the park is just these vast open areas that is there for animals to just move around so it's certainly not uh, like you would people think it's a you know wild park that you get in parts of europe where you drive in and you just see these animals you've got to drive around and spend time out there to see the animals yeah yeah and Satara uh, the, the photograph on the left gives you a really good idea of just how close the wildlife can come to the camps I mean and I've seen elephants closer than that at uh, Skakuza when they came across the river and they came right up to, and literally if you were daft enough you could have sort of well not quite touched them um, but they, they must have only been 15 feet away from us feeding it was an amazing experience to see something like that when you've just got that tiny little fence between you and, and the wildlife. So this is Satara. Yes, so Satara, also one of the bigger camps in the park. Um, Satara, unlike many of the others, is not situated close to a river, uh, but Satara is in what would be the closest sort of open savanna area that you'd find in the park and um, very well known for big cat sightings and um, it, it's got those bungalows if i just describe the images that you see there the bungalows again these circular bungalows they do again have a variety of accommodation to choose from the bird life is is 
quite typical for a more uh, open savanna type of habitat. Uh, wildlife uh, is quite good at nighttime as well. It's not uncommon to hear lions roaring at night. Uh, honey badger, as Alan was saying earlier, one of the species he's really uh, hoping to see sometime. The honey badgers that live within, within the camp, um, things like your African wildcat live in, inside the camp and people often bump into these at night. And then as the left image shows the lovely big elephants coming right up close to the camp fence, sometimes they'll actually even come closer than that. But uh, in this instance, they were having a drink at the water hole and um, the fences are electrified. So I'll just make mention of that. And often I think people still take too much um, chances by going right up to the fence when an elephant is there. And although these animals are, have gotten used to people moving inside the camps, you, sh you still need to respect the size of these animals. If they wanted to, they could come through that fence pretty easily. But that's the Tara, beautiful camp, very different habitat and vegetation to most of the other camps in the park. Yeah, yeah, I'm just I'm looking at that. That looks like a bench there. Um, and I'm just imagining myself sitting on that bench, just waiting for something like that to happen. Um, and I can almost smell it because, as I said, the smell of Kruger is it's just brilliant. It, it adds to the, it, it, this, like you said yesterday, the sights and the sounds just amazing. Right. Now then. So tell us a bit about Open. Yeah, so Open is at the close to one of the entrance gates to the park, which is actually called Open Gate. And Open lies directly west of Satara, you know, looking at about 40 kilometers drive between the two camps. Uh, so just again to to give you an impression of the vastness of the park. So between Open and Satara, there is one smaller satellite camp, which we'll touch on briefly as well. But other than that, you've just got 40, 45 kilometers of open bushveld. Um, open is one of the smaller camps. They've got those newly refurbished bungalows that you'll see there, um, ensuite facilities, that they've got their own little kitchenette where you can do your own cooking. Now, open doesn't actually have a restaurant where people can eat at, so staying there you would need to, to prepare uh, sufficiently to make your own meals. They recently got their swimming pool as well, and they've got a water hole just outside the camp, not far from, from where that swimming pool is, that it that's, uh, has a spotlight at night time and that attracts quite a lot of wildlife. Um, that area around Open is quite well known for things like cheetah, wild dogs often seen along there, and then just bigger herds of wildebeest, blue wildebeest and zebra that move through there. Um, so a fairly popular camp for people to stay at as well. Amazing. Amazing. <clears throat> and again, that view out to the park with just that small fence in between you and the park is just outstanding. Right, so tented camp. Yes, so, so this is Tamburti Tented Camp. As I just mentioned, there's a, a couple of satellite, what they refer to as satellite camps in the park. Tamburti is only a few kilometers from Open Gate, and you would actually be checking if you were to stay at Tamburti Tented Camp, you'd, you'd check in at Open uh, Camp. And this is a camp which only has tents. They've got some more basic camp, uh, basic tents, which this is an image of. And they overlook the Timbavati riverbed. I say riverbed because it very seldom has water in it. Um, but the camp itself, very popular as well, all natural bush between the tents. Uh, it certainly gives you that impression that you are out in the middle of the bush. And um, then they've got the slightly more luxurious tents that have got ensuite toilet and shower facilities. So for this one that the, the images of, you'd walk from your tent to communal ablution facilities to go and freshen up or take a shower. Um, and then they also have these communal kitchen areas where you could 
prepare meals if you wanted to. But as is typical for all the accommodation in the Kruger Park, they have their own uh, barbecue or braai area outside where you could have uh, or cook your own meat. And then Tambuti is also a good place to have honey badgers moving around camp. Um, unfortunately, they've gotten used to people feeding them, throwing some meat out for them or whatever the case may be. They push over dustbins and rummage through the dustbins. Uh, bird life is really good through the camp because of the natural vegetation. And then with it being along a riverbed like that, you may have uh, some of the bigger cats patrolling up and along the river uh, bed. Baboons are quite vocal and active around the area as well. So another popular camp. Excellent. And then you mentioned that that was a satellite camp. Um, and then you've got these two that are also, I believe, satellite camps. Is that right? Yes, correct. So that one there is Malalan Satellite Camp. Um, satellite just referring to it um, sort of almost being a, uh, well, it's a satellite camp to one of the main camps. Malalan uh, is a satellite camp to Bergendal, which we'll get to, which is one of the bigger camps. And these camps are for people that prefer something smaller and away from the crowds. They don't have the normal shop or restaurant facilities. That one there is Baluli. Baluli is another very popular camp. Those huts, there's only six of those huts and you need to book quite often at least a year in advance if you want to secure one of those. Uh, they're still based on the very old style uh, accommodation and the remainder of the camp is there for people who actually want to camp. So pretty small camp, a lot of hyena activity around and, and just the sounds and the noises at night are incredible in these camps just because you don't have that many people at one time visiting the camp. So you can really appreciate the sounds of the bush. Brilliant. And then we've moved sort of quite a bit further south now to the largest of the camps um, and a fantastic camp. This was the camp that I went to with the school when I was a kid, uh, changed my life. Uh, this is Gakuza. Yeah, um, as we've mentioned in a previous chat, we had uh, Skakuza is the largest camp in the park. It's sort of where the administration takes place. They have a post office. Um, they've actually got two swimming pools within the camp. They've got this lovely deck um, and quite a big area of the camp that faces the Sabi River, uh, where a variety of species can be seen from, and then uh, various accommodation types to choose from. And um, just uh, close to Skukuza camp, you have a nine-hole golf course for people that are interested in playing golf. And uh, it's a very popular camp. Uh, some people prefer to avoid these big camps, but the wildlife around Skakuza is very good. Um, you still hear hyenas quite often at night, lions roaring at night. So it's, a, it's still a very popular camp to be staying at uh, because of the good game viewing opportunities. And there's various routes that can be driven um, to see various species. Yeah, and um, I know it's a big camp, and I know people don't so particularly, you know, or some people don't like to, um, you know, mix with a, a bigger crowd. But I have to say that, you know, a, a general day when you're going out camping, uh, going out on safari, is you, you start off really early, you come back, and you have a break during sort of any time from about eleven, half eleven till about two, and in that period, then you go back out at two. In that period, a lot of people go and catch up on sleep or they just sit around and chill out. I bird watch the whole time that I'm there and walk around the camp. And from my point of view, you know, you hardly bump into anybody during that period. You know, when I was walking around the camp, all right, when you get to the pools, you might get the odd family in the pool. But in the main, they're staying around the rondavels or the, the accommodation and they're, they're having a chill and a, a sleep. Um, I bird watched around that every day that I was in the camp and hardly bumped into anybody. 
And while I'm talking about walking around the camp, it's worth walking around the camp at night, as, as Robert's already mentioned. Uh, this camp's really famous for some of the bush babies. Um, I bumped into quite a few of them. Uh, it's amazing. And if you've got a torch and you're walking with a torch, as well as sort of looking on the outskirts, if you shine it across the top of the grass, you get lots of spider's eyes. Now, I don't know whether that put you off, but it, it was great for me. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, regardless of whether it's a big camp and there's a lot of people in it, I still think it's a brilliant camp and has lots of opportunities because it's big for wandering around, doing a bit of bird watching and watching the monkeys and things like that. It's really good. Then we come to Lois yeah, Sar. So this is this is one of Denise's favourites. We, we've only called in here for a, a couple of breaks. Um, but this is a superb camp. Yeah, so uh, Lois Sarby, I would I would say is probably one of the most popular camps in the Kruger Park. Uh, again, this is one of the areas where you're not likely to find accommodation easily. Uh, and the reason for that is it's uh, again adjacent to the Sarby River, which we just spoke about Skakuza. So Skakuza is upstream from Lower Sabi and um, Lower Sabi the the game viewing opportunities are just incredible around Lower Sabi uh, they the, the camp actually burnt down uh, years ago I fail to remember the actual, actual date and then they ended up building this new structure that you will see on the left there which is a restaurant and there's a shop there and people of course love going to sit out on the deck there enjoying a breakfast or a lunch or even dinner and having that amazing view over the river and where that photo was taken from is a bridge that you can actually drive across and then you get closer to the hippopotamus and crocodiles and various bird species and animals and then you have that view back um, at the camp a lot of the accommodation also overlooks the Kruger uh, overlooks the Sabi River um, and that picture, the smaller insert there is what is typically called the, the perimeter bungalows. Uh, they are slightly more expensive. You do get cheaper alternative accommodation. Uh, so uh, La Sapi also has tented accommodation. Uh, one of the smaller camps, but as I say, very popular camp, great for game viewing and um, various routes to travel on from there as well. Yeah, and there's a yeah. there's a dam just outside of it as well that is absolutely outstanding for sort of sitting and watching wildlife. Uh, obviously, you have to be in your car, but yeah, I mean, we we sat there a few times, and it, it's it's really really cool. Yeah, so it's, it's just quickly to touch on that sun, it's called Sunset Dam, and uh, it would probably be one of the most popular or most well-known dams in the park because it's just a hive of activity. Um, any season you go there, there's always, you could you could spend ages just enjoying the, the wildlife. And then this is uh, Pretorius Cup. Uh, Pretorius Cup is based in the very southwestern side of the Kruger Park. And the vegetation around Pretorius Cup is, is quite unique. Uh, what we refer to as silver cluster leaf uh, trees uh, more of a broadleaf tree, uh, um, long or tall grass, thatch grass, which dominates through the area. It's um, become more of a popular camp uh, in the last few years. People typically um, avoided the camp because they felt that the game viewing wasn't as good. But it's the the vegeta because of the vegetation and the thatch grass in the area, the game viewing is. Uh, trickier because it's not that easy to see into the the bush as you would in the more open savanna areas but the le leopards are quite well known for the area uh, the lions move through there quite a bit buffalo it's probably one of the better camps for seeing rhinos and um, so the wildlife is is very good and then Pretorius Corp areas is probably more well known for species like your Liechtenstein's hartebeest, which is the only place in the park where you can find them. It's one of the better places in the park to see uh, antelope like your sable antelope. Um, so if you're into some of the more unusual species, it would definitely be a good place to stay at. Pretorius Corp Camp is uh, was the first camp that was 
opened in the Kruger Park, so one of the older camps. But of course, the the units or the accommodation that you see there is not what it looked like back in the day. These are new refurbished units. Yeah, and I can vouch for that camp because that's where we stayed in exactly them uh, bungalows there, uh, all of them. Um, that that was an outstanding area to be in, and the wildlife around the area was spectacular. So I, I don't know where people were coming from with, um, you know, not thinking there was wildlife. We had uh, just the other side of that fence there that you can see in the left hand picture. We had elephant. We had various species of antelope along there. I had some fantastic birds in the camp. Um, really, really nice camp. I really, really enjoyed being there. And you, you mentioned the Liechtenstein's hartebeers. Um, we saw five of them uh, oh. just outside, the, well, not just outside, but on our way back to the camp. We saw five of them. Uh, I got photographs and then only realised that actually what we'd seen was 10% of the number that was in the hall of, of Kruger Park, because according to the animal count, there's only 50 in the whole mm -hmm. park. So we were extremely lucky and we saw them. We also saw Sable, which fantastic, how well, unbelievable antelope. I, antelope sometimes get overlooked and, and you, you do. I mean, I don't get fed up with seeing Impala or, or Lion's Buffy as they're called, but, um, because I think they're fantastic, but you do see a lot of Impala, but some of the other uh, antelope are fantastic as well. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, a lot of people, obviously, there's a big marketing hype around the big five, but the places like the Kruger Park have such an amazing species diversity that you can go in there and you can just, there's, there's so much to appreciate, so many species, whether it is the big five or looking at the smaller antelope, reptiles, butterflies, birds, um, you could just, spend forever in there if you're a nature lover there is so much to appreciate yeah yeah and, and a shout out for a tree as well because the um now it's gone out of my head is what's the tree with the big seed on it is it elephant tree is it no what, what's the sausage the, tree, sausage yeah. tree. yeah and that's great when Denise and them guys see this, they'll be laughing at me now, going, how could you not remember a sausage tree? Um, which have got like big sausage, you wouldn't want one falling on your head because they are big and heavy. Uh, they would probably kill you, but um, they, they're amazing things to see. It's, it's just something that's completely out of the ordinary like that, that you'll come across in some of the camps, which is just amazing. Correct. Begum Dahl, yeah, this this was the other one that we stayed in. We we sort of did two weeks and we did a week in one and a week in the other. Um, that's that's pretty much the accommodation that we were in. Um, it's not my photograph, but it, it was pretty much that. Um, this particular dam was dried up when we were there, uh, but I know it's a big attraction when it's not dried up. So if you tell us about Bergen Dahl. Yeah, so Bergen Dahl, um in the very southwestern corner of the park, close to Malalan Gate. Uh, as Alan has said, that's the typical accommodation you get there, different from the other camps in the park and that they have those, it's sort of an A-frame uh, shaped unit or bungalow. And then um, quite a big camp, well known for a, a trail that you can do that goes all around the, the edge or along the fence of the camp. Um, a lot of nice, vegetation within the camp as well so the bird life is phenomenal and then you've got this dam which is seasonal but it's got water some uh, water for most of the year and then of course as can be expected it attracts a lot of wildlife especially in the drier season and then you can actually see the fence there uh, they've got a couple of benches there and you can just sit out there and enjoy the animals and the bird life as they come and go so very popular camp um, uh, for people living just outside the Kruger Park in towns like Nelspreit, uh, they'd often just go to Bergendal for the weekend because it's close enough and the, the wildlife is really good around there as well. Um, often wild dogs seen in the area. Uh, Bergendal has, as you can see in the, in the background, in the larger images, the uh, larger image, as the mountains, uh, most of the park is fairly flat, but around Bachendal, you've got these hills, mountains, 
rocky outcrops which favor certain species so it's it's a different type of habitat and um, it certainly appeals to many people it is it's brilliant i mean getting up early morning and birding around that camp was just stunning um so yeah that that's another I could highly recommend them all, but that, that you know, again, that's that's a brilliant camp. And with regards to wild dogs, when we went out on a, um, a sort of dusk, uh, sorry, a dawn drive, which we'll talk about when I come back to you, Robert, um, we saw hunting dogs on the hunt uh, within about a mile of the camp along the tarmac road, and we'd seen them the day before and they were all sort of happy jolly you know just having a wander around just playing with one another and then the next morning to see the change in their stature was unbelievable to see them when they'd gone into hunting mode and just an exceptional thing to watch crocodile bridge the one that's right on the south of the park yeah, so complete opposite side to Bergendal. This is southeastern side of the park. Um, the, as the name suggests, Crocodile Bridge. It's at the Crocodile Bridge entrance gate. Um, and the, the camp is also fairly small. They've got only got a few of those tented units, as you can see in the bottom left corner, uh, overlooking the bush right next to the, the fence. And then if you have a look at the larger image to the right, those are, again, the typical rondavel-shaped circular bungalows. Uh, also have a view out over the bush. And um, Crocodile Bridge, uh, very close to the Mozambican border, but a very popular camp as well. A lot of people go in through Crocodile Bridge early mornings or just for a day drive. The game viewing in the area is exceptional, uh, more open savanna type. Uh, vegetation or habitats again, um, well known for big cat sightings, um, elephants, uh, all of the big five really, and um, it's just one of those areas where you can expect to see just about anything. So a, a very popular camp. Right, I'm going to come back to you now, he says, remembering to press the button this time. Right. Thanks for that. that. That's a really good overview. And um, one thing I wanted to touch on, because we didn't touch on it yesterday, and it, it's my fault, I should have um, sort of remembered. Um, there's two things that I would highly recommend, and, and you can give us a little bit more detail around them. It's, one of them is the early morning. So when I say early morning, I mean earlier morning than, you know, the norm. Uh, and it's a, a, a walk, a, you know, out in the park uh, with two guys with big guns. You have to have them. That that would be really foolish not to have them. Um, so you know, that that's an amazing experience. And then the other thing is the um, the dusk drive, sort of going out when the sun's setting and seeing the the night animals in the park. So are they available through all the camps? Because they are outstanding. Yes. So all the camps you can do those night drives and the, the morning bushwalks. You, you can actually do a morning or an afternoon bushwalk. The morning walks are typically um, uh, more popular. The afternoons can still be quite warm in the summer months, um, but you can book those through any of the camps or from any of the camps. And then the you get a sunset drive, which leaves uh, the, it varies from camp to camp, but typically sort of an hour before the gates close, the camp gates close, and then it goes out, you see the sunset, and then you hopefully get some of the movements of the nocturnal species, and you return back to camp. That's a three-hour drive. Uh, and then some of the bigger camps also have what they call a late-night drive. So once the sunset drive is returned to camp, you can then go out on a, a drive, which is then just in the darkness uh, or at night. Uh, that's a shorter drive, two hours. And um, so it just depends on sort of what you're after, but those are available throughout the park. Yeah, that's amazing, that's amazing. So um, we will leave it there. Uh, hopefully that's given people a really good introduction to the camps and sort of where to stay in Kruger. Um, I have to say that, you know, whichever camp you stay in, make sure you 
sort of spend some time in the camp. You know, when I say spend some time, I mean, walk around it. <laughs> so don't just, because, uh, I mean, I, I did. I, I, I know that the norm is to sort of try and catch on, uh, up on a bit of sleep between the two drives. Um, I can hand on heart say I never once did that in all the time I've been to Kruger. Um, I, as soon as we got back, I, we had breakfast supplied by you guys and then I was off and I was wandering around and I must know the camps inside out now that I've stayed at because there is just so much to see both from the camp but in the camp. The bird life in the camp, reptiles, the insect life as you mentioned, just stunning. And even some of the sort of flora and fauna, yeah, the sorry, flora is is really really cool. So spend a lot of time wandering around the camp. I can highly recommend it. Robert, thank you ever so much. And the next one we're going to do is going to be on the big five that you mentioned, and we'll talk about sort of well what they are, and, you know, roughly where you can see them, uh, but also a little bit about sort of the conservation about of, of those species. Um, and then we'll go on to now. I keep calling it the, uh, the, I think I was calling it the small five, but according to this, and, and by the way, I can highly recommend this, uh, regardless of whether you're, because it, it has a tendency to disappear, you see? <laughs> so yeah, I can highly recommend this because regardless of whether you're with guides or whether you're self, I'm going to put it down because it, this is it's really freaking me out now. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I highly recommend that map. Uh, it doesn't really disappear. And that's because whether you're going on the guided tour or whether you're guiding yourself, if you're guiding yourself, you've got to have it. But even if you're not, it's a fabulous little book to have and it's a great keepsake. I've got sort of the last two from the last visit. Uh, they're really good. They've got checklists in of sort of some of the birds you'll see and some of the mammals you'll see. Uh, also, a great overview of the camps and obviously give you a map. Uh, so really good. Um, yeah, what I was going to say was, it's the, it's not the the big five, and there's something like the big five, the little five, and the small five, isn't there? No, it's the big five and the little five. Ah, right. Well, the small five, according to this, is if you see baby leopards, um, baby lions, and I'm thinking, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. We'll cover that in the big five. <laughs> right. I'll leave you to it, and I will speak to you again in the very near future, and we'll do the big five. Fantastic. Thank you for your time, Alan. Thanks, Robert. Take care. See you soon. Bye. Bye.